Welcome to Vernacular Reality, the VR-focused extension of Language Matters by Diplomatic Language Services. Join me, Blythe Collins, as I explore how a language company can implement virtual reality as a learning tool. Welcome back to Vernacular Reality. This week, we have a guest who comes to us from the West Coast, um, the beauty of recording and sharing digital or virtually. We are sitting down with Jim Topol. He is a longtime product lead in the gaming industry. He's done a lot of work with unique hardware systems, such as the Rock Band games, and he has been kind enough to join us for our episode of Vernacular Reality. So welcome, Jim. Welcome back, Sean. And it's great to have you guys. Yeah, thanks, uh, Blythe and Sean, for having me. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, I'm a design product manager hybrid, and I've been working in what I call weird interfaces for the past decade or so. Um, spent some time on both sides of the hardware divide, uh, working on all those fake plastic guitars from about a decade ago, moved over to uh, Connect Games. So how do I control this thing with just my body? And uh, then move from there into the VR space where uh, Sean and I met. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we met a couple of years ago at um, something called an immersive design retreat. Um, Chatham University out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania had put on this program. This was the inaugural event in a, a what turned into a um, many year series of, of retreats that they did um, where we basically got to hang out at uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water for almost a week. Um, no, no computers, uh, just sat around and talked about art and architecture and design and virtual reality and and do it in the context of this uh, really amazing space, um, which was which was really kind of like going going into it. I had no idea how this was going to relate. Like Frank Lloyd Wright and VR, what is what is that about? <laughs> but uh, you know, when you, when you get there and you start you start learning about his history, you know, you really get this. Uh, you really get the sense of how he's designing a space for the whole body to inhabit, and that's kind of what we're doing in VR too. That was definitely one of the most exciting experiences I've had uh, in the VR industry. It was on my checklist, my bucket list for a long time, just to go see that building ever since I was a little kid. I like how you both kind of could take that base um, education of and that experience and then take it into two different, I don't know, sort of branches of immersive software. You know, they're very different in their functionality, but very similar, I guess, at, at their core. It had a it had a very significant formative impact on my thinking about virtual reality design. I think I think the biggest thing was the concept of how do we how do we breathe life into spaces? What do what is what is the disconnect between you know what we think of as the dead virtual thing and the living real thing? And and how can we how can we work to try to bridge that gap? One of the things that struck me most, and I was working in Los Angeles at this time at the time, and there's something about my time in LA where I became acutely aware of architecture. I think we were down the street from a couple Frank Gehry buildings and uh, my family's favorite uh, ice cream place uh, was an architecturally uh, inspired ice creamery. I don't even know what you call them called Cool House. Uh, it's a good architecture joke. It's a deep cut, um, but it was uh, really exciting. And I loved um, going to this space that was man-made, but still felt organic in a way. Um, was immediately juxtaposed against previous VR creation endeavors where we were trying to build like these James Terrell inspired spaces in virtual reality, which uh, I don't want to say never works, but is, is kind of antithetical to what James Terrell is working on. And I came from this world in Los Angeles that had these great examples of, of built spaces. And 
it was really interesting to go see this uh, one that felt very organic and felt lived in. I'm just, I can still picture in my head that one hallway uh, where at the end, went over the driveway and at the end, a part of the the rocks and part of the moss and part of the the uh, the outside broke through and there was just a little bit of water coming in like like it, it, nature was in, not even intruding into the space it's just the space was in harmony with the built world that was there before the house and uh, that was uh, really inspiring for me uh, I felt exactly the same way here is this thing this place where a person has placed their stamp, but they've they've not done it in an overly destructive way. They've done it in a way that was respectful of its environment. It's it's something that I've I've personally kind of struggled with with like hiking and camping and stuff, and never you know it kind of it kind of dawned on me at one time. I never really feel comfortable. I never really feel at home. And you look at an animal, and an animal out in the woods, it has no conception of feeling at home in the woods. It's just like, what are you talking about, dude? And that that level of comfort that we get with our home space that we don't get in in public or in in places that we revere. Um, you know, sitting in, sitting in falling water and, and at first not feeling at home um, until, you know, you're there having a meal or seeing some friends play a card game in the, in the kitchen table. Um, And then suddenly some light switch goes off and, and then it's, and then it feels like a home. What would you say is it about a place, a space that makes it feel like home? Home to me feels like I have a place and that I know where in a particular space, what role I'm supposed to play in that space, whether it's my living room, I can sit on the couch or this is my desk and I'm here to work. The spaces almost have verbs to them. I know their places, their nouns, but they, they they help inform the way I should behave when I am inside of them. I think it's I think it is those actions, and I think it is those those ways of of moving about in that space, as you said. Um, because what is what is more personal than our body? You know, our body is our our uniquely owned domain, um, and so. If you can, if you can express your body in that space, then it must be the home space versus versus the uh, the other space where you feel as if you are an interloper. I like that, and to me, it's most effective when it becomes like a conversation because it's not just my body in the space, but it's also the space around my body, and they they both impact each other. Um, it it feels like certain spaces change the way I am looking at kind of the, the thing I'm doing that day, or they, they encourage me to behave in a certain way. Um, if, if the, if there's big windows open and I have a better sense of communing with nature. And, uh, if there is a, a long, tiny, uncomfortable tunnel, like, like in falling water, many of the hallways were very small in a, in a way that was almost arresting in a modern American ADA compliant housing unit. Uh, they, the hallways wanted you to not be there, to keep moving. And I really love that relationship with space and physical interfaces. So you're putting a lot of value on moving around these spaces. How would you say that fits into immersive software? I think it's the it's one of the key value adds of immersive software that we have this about, uh, ability to be able to move within it. We kind of ask a lot of users to put on a headset. You know, if you're doing something um, in the VR and you get a text message on your phone, now you got to take off your headset and deal with the text message and then go back in. Um, and so you have this switching cost going back and forth. Um, and when you have a cost like that, you need to be providing something of commensurate value uh, in, in response. And, um, 
and to me that that ability to engage the body to be able to move around and and not just not just have an application in front of the user that the user pokes at and and the application then sends data back through their eyes you know in a in a beam from a giant rectangle of light um you know you have uh you have this intimate immersed relationship with the software with the machine with the task that you were performing um i've i've for a long time i've always felt like using a vr application was less like using a piece of software and more like wearing a piece of clothing when it's when it's really done well when it's really done well it it responds to me and it flows around me and uh and I don't have to necessarily address it directly. Like you put your, your hand in your pocket to pull out your keys. You don't look directly at your pocket and, and engage your hand and insert into pocket and grab keys and pull out. You don't, you don't construct this whole command structure to do that. You just, you just feel around in the bottom of your pocket and pull out the keys. That's frankly, one of the things that most excites me about, spatial interfaces is is a, a, I and I hope in the future it, it can open up computing to a wide swath of people who are pretty underserved by e definitely the old text-based kind of like DOS interfaces but even the graphical user interfaces are still 2D and flat like I'm I'm reminded of one of my college jobs as at the moving company and just how physically satisfying it was to drive truck to house, pick thing up out of house and slowly close all the doors as you emptied out the closets, you had emptied out the master bedroom. And there was like this physical record of the work you had done. You filled up the truck like you were playing Tetris, drove truck to new house and then watched as you emptied that truck out you you had all these interesting physical reminders of the progress of of your day and the progress of your toil you're like oh we're we're like three rings down into the 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 truck or i remember that this mattress is coming up next as soon as we remove the mattress it's the front it's the, the dining set and i'm convinced that that computers can still become yet more accessible uh, by providing these physical interfaces for people that, you know, for whatever reason, text interfaces aren't, aren't engaging for them or these kind of like flat, I think the, the hip kids on Twitter are calling them pancake interfaces, uh, just aren't really working for them. Uh, I, I, at least I'm hopeful anyway. So like watching a video or just trying to read an, an article on your phone isn't enough anymore. I don't know if it's not enough, but it could be better. I mean, like, I, I'm a weird dinosaur that that can't process uh, video tutorials and always I'm like, I want the written one, right? So I can follow along. But I think that actually speaks to like the, the, the wide array of learning styles in out there and computers are very good at a couple of them. Um, but I think we're, we're probably not serving all of the learning styles uh, you know, in, in the current computing paradigm. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. There's, um, I'm, I'm right there with you with, uh, not really appreciating video tutorials. Um, like I can't, uh, control F fine keywords in this, can I? It's, it's something that I think we see in, in, uh, a lot of like social VR apps where people figure out new ways of using the software, um, you don't have to, you don't really have to come up with all kinds of really interesting features like like buttons and resharings and, and emoji gestures. And um, you, you don't have to do all of those sort of things. People just figure out ways to congregate in the VR space online and have conversations and make them meaningful with, with body language and, and gestures and all the things that we normally do in real life, they, they become embodied in the virtual space without us having to program anything specific in for that. 
that's exciting. That's exciting when a user can use the tool in a way that you don't predict or, or never even gave any specific uh, a specific you know, tooling for, um, then it becomes a, a gigantic realm of possibility that uh, that you know rewards creativity rather than trying to rather than trying to fit people all into a single proscribed box. Yeah, I'm reminded a little bit of uh, one of the previous projects I worked on. It was called Mind Show, where you could. Uh, this is going to sound like a fever dream, but uh, you could pick kind of these cartoon environments uh, using some VR tools, decorate the environments, place characters in them. And then you would jump into the characters using a tool. And because we know where your hands were in VR and where your head was, we could map those to the cartoon characters. And when you moved around, you could essentially, we called it puppeteering, but you could perform as these uh, silly characters, the space alien, space captain. And what we had found is even with those three data points, where the two hands are and where the head is at, I could I could tell which one of my coworkers made a piece of content without their audio. When when they're pretending to be the alien, like I knew it was Max just from from those little three tracked points. I could tell the I could intuit their body language. Uh, I could tell that, that Max's performance was different than Luke, than was different than Sydney's, and it was uh, really interesting to be in a virtual world and get that feedback. It's not something you see even um, we're we're on a video call right now while we're recording this, and and I'm missing that feedback. And when it is there, it creates a more natural form of communication and a more natural environment to I think collaborate in a world where we're not all going back to work, but some of us are going back to work in re like in physical places and other people are going to be displaced. Like, I think it's going to become more important than ever to find ways to simulate or replace that natural body language. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, that's, that's actually why I got into VR. That's actually why I decided to make this career uh, a career. I, uh, I had started playing around with VR um, and, you know, thought it was a lot of fun, made a small little project, got a small little amount of internet fame within the VR community for it. Got a call, got a cold call from um, a, a company that wanted to hire me. And um, we did the interview in their, in their application, in their, in their VR social app. And uh, it was amazing just to have this conversation with a person across the country and have it feel like being face to face with that person rather than, um, you know, at the time Skype was the big uh, teleconferencing software um, and, you know, all of its problems uh, of, you know, just like we have zoom today of feeling disconnected and feeling, feeling uh, exhausted by it and everything. Um, but to have this really super compelling conversation and to be talking in, in a way, you know, like I, uh, I have, I experience when I go to like meetups and, and, and meet up with other enthusiasts and you get that really excited animated way of talking, um, you know, that, that was incredible. And it was, it was a bit addicting. And at the end of the, at the end of the interview, they asked me, when can you move to the West coast? And I said, are you joking? Do you not see what you have in your hands right now? It, it's funny. And, and I, I want this future. I, I want this future to be there. But I, I still feel the pressure of wanting to co-locate with people. And, and like my most recent project was 100% remote from the start. And the whole time I'm sitting there, man, this is great. This is awesome. It's so flexible. But boy, I could wish I could just lean over and say like, there should be, you know, 10% higher or more blue. The amount of additional friction involved in communicating those like little tiny changes, it makes a difference and it adds up. And, and it seems almost like a paradox to say, uh, by putting these headsets on, by going through all these hoops and buying these expensive computers and it, communication is actually going to be more accessible 
because you will get to leverage all of your real world communication experience. Ever since you were a baby, you were building mental models on, on how humans interact in a space. To, is someone smiling at you? Are they making eye contact with you? Are they shrugging? Are they, are they breathing? Are they leaning forward like they're ready to talk? And by going through all of this work and putting these headsets on and going through these digital kind of communication experiences, I s believe that in the end, it will result in more accessible collaboration tools. I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important for us as a, as a language instruction company, you know, foreign language instruction company to be building uh, these virtual reality tools. Um, you know, what, what is our job? What is our job? Our job is to, is it to teach people a foreign language or is it to teach people how to communicate? And it's, it's really to teach people how to communicate. And part of that is part of that is the language. Part of that is the grammar, the syntax, the vocabulary, all of that sort of stuff. But part of it is culture. Part of it is is a, a very intangible thing of of explaining explaining to a person how you talk to somebody else, not what you say when you talk to them, but how do you talk to them? And that that that's not going to come over text. You can't do that over over a, a textbook. Um, you can't do that over a video series because it fundamentally requires feedback. Um, and so that's why for, you know, for 35 years, we've had such a successful business with this uh, very personalized one-on-one uh, -on -one focused system. Um, but this is, that's obviously very limited in reach. You can't, you, you you can only reach the people in your immediate environment. Um, you know, I can't after after the after the job interview experience, I started thinking about how you know Google and Facebook talk about how they only hire the best and brightest in the world, and what they really mean is they only hire the best and the brightest that they can convince to move to California. And and so there's there's so many people in the world that you know we talk about the importance of a diversity and the importance of of different viewpoints and and why are you going to shut yourself off from from all those people when just because they they aren't physically located next to you and and i think that's a big i mean that's a big goal of mine with the with the work that we're doing here um as a vr enthusiast as a software developer I'm not. I'm not bringing foreign language uh, uh, expertise into the mix. I'm bringing. I'm bringing a different set of expertise. That's my personal goal here in the company. Is is not just not just improving the foreign language instruction, which is which is absolutely the base goal, but to expand people's concepts of what communication can be. You you're you're expanding the impact or increasing the impact of that instruction, um, even, even if it isn't just the, the rote curriculum, by transporting someone to a different location, and there is all kinds of supporting evidence to suggest that the following statement is true, that when people move to new locations or move to strange spaces that aren't comfortable to them or that aren't their home, that the, and this is both in physical spaces and, and temporally too. So it, time, um, kind of like calendar milestones, people can use those dates uh, to impact change in their behaviors. One of the things I was most excited when you showed me uh, like a screen cap of the thing you're working on is that it took me to another place. And when I'm learning something new or when I am... Uh, trying to change my behavior in a some, some way, I personally find it helpful to go somewhere new. Um, that, that, that sense of exploration and the sense of disrupting my normal routine helps me learn a new thing or stop doing a bad thing or doing, doing something new that I, I wouldn't do before because of just the natural momentum of my previous space. And uh, that's pretty exciting. And, and I've Another thing I found working on the silly cartoon creator um, was that one of our goals was to help adults 
who have forgotten that they could be creative to to be creative as well. Like this is something that was in the DNA of the company. And we found that almost 100% of the time when you put someone into the headset, um, they would initially start off standing still in the space, holding the VR controllers straight up like they were ice cream cones, forgetting to really move, forgetting to explore. And they're very much aware that they're humans in a space. Um, but after we you know, put them on an alien planet, uh, we would tell some jokes with them, get them to loosen up. They would kind of forget that there was an audience of humans around them. And they started playing in a way that I am 100% convinced would never have happened if they were on like an improv stage and they could see everyone out there staring at them and all of the kind of like the backlit heads and the backlit faces staring at them. And it, it was a really great, uh, great way to break down the barriers that, you know, have convinced a lot of adults that they aren't creative, they aren't funny, they aren't interesting people. Like that's, uh, I have found, you know, a lot of people have either been taught that those things aren't true or um, have learned that they aren't true just by living here in, in adult land. And it was great to put them somewhere else and let them be kids again. That's really beautiful. When else would adults have the chance to do to do this, to like explore and like, <laughs> I don't know, to like move your body in a new way? It's kind of discovering um, what it is to be human again. Yeah, well, it, it, these worlds, they all have physics that are like our world, but a little bit different. And those are, in my experience, incredibly interesting for people because it is go back to uh, a kid building up a tower of blocks and knocking down that tower of blocks over and over and over again. And they're, they're empirically deriving the rules of our current universe over uh, and, and that provides great joy to them. Like there's, there's some theories out there that all play is learning and that is what actually is fun about play. And, uh, giving adults the opportunity to have that same experience again is pretty cool. It might help rewire the creative creative brain a little bit, get people o- opening themselves up to change. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, we recently had the opportunity to um, watch a talk from a neurocognitive scientist. He he laid that he laid all of that out in scientific terms. Uh, it's exactly right. You know, when you when you're engaging the body, you're you're not just it's not just because it feels more fun. It literally is lighting up new sections of the brain. It's creating new connections between the information um, that you're learning and, uh, and that enhances recall. It's like strings all interconnected together. And if you can pull, if, if you can make the strings more connected then when you pull on one, it, it, it makes an, another, another jiggle um, farther away. Um, And, and the more you can engage all of these different senses and these different modes of thinking and these different modes of working, um, the more you just really embed all of that information in people's brains. So it's fascinating stuff. And it's something we're, uh, we're looking forward to expanding on, um, you know, just really, just really designing learning around He's he's physical operators of, you know, of thinking about it kind of like a kind of like a math problem of I I have I have the addition operator, I have the multiplication operator, or I have the physical embodiment operator, I have the learning in motion operator, and I can combine these things and 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 know and be confident in improving the the learning outcome for for the student. That's really cool. I think that there is a and I'm going to hate on pancake things for a little bit. I, I think there is a a current trend in UX design for mobile, and this it, it's true for mobile because no one's got any time when you're on a mobile device. But to you know reduce the number of taps to get to an answer or get to the result, and all of it is very uh, kind of. It, it's it's focused on getting the answer and it's not focused on the process of it. And one of the things I'm really excited about these spatial interfaces is they are by nature slower. Uh, it, it, and I think there's an interesting opportunity to celebrate the process of getting to an answer 
and might help us uh, when when you're learning um, and when you're when you're trying to teach a group of people something. I I still to this day remember the moment when our calculus teacher in high school helped the group of kids empirically derive calculus, like the concept of calculus. She could have just gone up there and said, area under the curve, here's the formula, go nuts. But she walked us through a uh, very abbreviated process that like Newton and all of those, uh, all of the early math math mathematicians walked through, what went through, uh, they had a much harder time at it. They had to discover their way, but by walking us through this process and taking the time, like we got to own that discovery in a little bit, uh, in a little bit of a way. And we internalize it, at least I did. I don't know about the rest of the kids in the class, um, but that's really exciting is a chance to slow down and focus on, on the process and, and the, the journey of learning. Yeah, that's, I think that's, uh, that's a big component of it. And, and, you know, you kind of made a, a little, throwaway comment about there, at least for me, you had said, um, I think that's another thing that VR is going to let us do is that it's going to allow us to create these learning experiences for you, for the individual, for the, the wonderful little crystal of a person that you are. Um, and not just as a, not just as a, everybody's on the same bus together and we're going to go down the road and if you don't learn with what the lesson is today, well, we got a new lesson tomorrow. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be able to bring everybody along. And that's, that's exciting. There is such a wide use for this software and this type of learning, you know, whether it's for foreign language training or whether it's for, you know, quote unquote, a silly game. Either way, you are getting so much more out of this way of learning. I think that is a valuable through line that I've learned from your conversation. And it was great to talk to you both. So thank you for being here, Jim. And thank you, Sean, as always. That was super fun. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Blythe. And thank you, Jim. It was great talking with you again. Have a great one. See you on the next episode. Later, taters. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Vernacular Reality. I hope you'll continue the conversation with us by searching Diplomatic Language Services on Facebook and LinkedIn, following us on Instagram at DC Language, or tweeting us at Diplomatic LS.